ladies today, and gentlemen. I see some gentlemen around. Um, <laughs> um, so I get a little scattered when I first get up here, and then I'll calm down after a minute. But um, I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad to be back with with the sisters. I was on a, a bit of a um, well needed uh, sabbatical there for a minute, so I'm, I'm definitely glad to be to be back with you, ladies. And um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what happened for me, what it was like, and then what things were like once I got out, um, and then I will talk about what we're doing now. Um, so my first experience actually with a pimp was when I was in seventh grade. I um, didn't know he was a pimp until I had been out of the life for a while and talking about the issue and then it clicked. But I was pretty much like any other typical seventh grader, um, eighth grader, we went we had a big dance. I think it was no, it was ninth grade. That's right, it was ninth grade. We had our um, we had our big dance and, and all that stuff at school, and so a bunch of us rented a limo, a bunch of girls and guys, and um, decided to go into the big bad city of Portland, Oregon. And uh, we we're we I grew up in Vancouver, Washington, which is a suburb of Portland, and so it was a big thing for us to go across the river um, into the city, and so we took. Um, a limo over there and we're all walking around downtown and there was this guy in a Cadillac um, It was a white Cadillac. I do remember that an old Cadillac I'm not sure what what year and he was hanging out on the side of the road and He had his hat on and hey hey hey, girls girls. What are you up to and, and by this time the guys were off? I don't know what they were doing. We could see them, but they were off doing their thing and you know It was me and a couple of the girls and we were in our prom dresses and hey hey hey, what are you guys doing? And a couple of us walked over because we were like, what? What are you talking about? And this was in the late 90s. Um, and he was like, oh, what are you ladies doing? You know, what are you up to? Look at you. And, and the spiel, which I don't remember all of the spiel. And we got to talking to him. But then, thankfully, um, the guys were like, hey, girls, let's go. We're, we're hopping a ride um, somewhere else. And I was like, OK. Didn't even think about it. Didn't even register. Um, what was going on? We just remember talking about this crazy guy who tried to talk to us downtown. Um, so I realized later on that that was my um, first experience with a pimp in the city of Portland. Um, I'm going to jump fast forward to my senior year of high school. Um, by the time I was a senior in high school, I had been dealing with depression, post traumatic stress from previous traumas. Um, the budding stages of alcoholism, and in a family life that, from the outside in, you know, it was a suburban, I don't know, it was just like a suburban family. Um, <laughs> from the outside looking in, we looked pretty normal, right? We went to school, um, me and my brother, and um, my parents were still together, and they worked their jobs. Um, but there was a lot of emotional um, stuff going on in the family. My mother, you know, my mother did the best she could with what she had, both of my parents did, um, but it was definitely a, a challenging upbringing with a lot of emotional abuse, a lot of um, trauma at an early age, and then just not having a family or a structure to deal with a lot of that trauma. So by the time I, I graduated high school, I was in a pretty um, dark space emotionally. My father, who was my cheerleader, was diagnosed with cancer when I was 18. And my graduation present was finding out if he was going to continue to live or not was the timing of it. And so that sent me into a place where I just didn't know how to handle um, life. Um, when I was 18 and I graduated high school, barely graduated high school, I was one of those kids too. Um, I was too busy doing other stuff. Um, but I graduated high school and I did what kids my age normally did. I wanted to get the heck out of the house. Um, and so I moved in with a friend, and at that point, that's when my alcoholism kind of kind of took off quite a bit. Um, I was, long story short, um, I ended up moving back in with my my parents um, because that was a failed transition, and um, I was pretty heavily into alcohol. And it just didn't work out. So there was a combination of me getting kicked out um, because I couldn't live by my parents' rules and me being the 18-year-old defiant, stubborn girl that I was, um, I ended up on the streets. So I was living in my car for a while. Um, a friend of mine who I went to high school with who was older than me was a stripper um, in Portland. And, and 
no intention of going down that road. We used to joke around in high school that, you know, when we graduated, we were going to be strippers because it was a big, weird, cool thing, I guess. And we, she graduated high school and went on to become a stripper, and I didn't at first. Um, when I found myself homeless, not able or willing to go back to my parents' house, um, I reached out to the person that I knew that I could reach out to, which was that girl. Um, so that began my trip down um, dancing. That was not a career path of mine that I particularly wanted to do. Um, I, in my head, I was going to get in, work for a couple months, get the money that I needed, and get out. That was just, that was it. And needless to say, that did not happen. Um, I got into that life. My first dancing experience, I was sober. And um, I don't even know how to explain just that first time, the degradation and the shame, and just the feelings of like, what in the heck am I doing? Um, I don't even know how to explain that feeling that happened on that first time. But the only way that I knew that I was going to continue to get through it was to not be sober um, and get through it. Um, that introduced me to a whole host of, of drugs. I don't know, honestly, I don't know what came first. Um, a lot of times I don't know if it was trauma, I don't know if it was drugs and alcohol, I don't, you know, looking back on my story and looking back on a lot of the stories of these girls that we run into, you can't really pinpoint a beginning, um, a beginning point. Um, but that was the beginning for me of, exploitation, I guess. Um, that went on for a couple years, and I was in and out um, of living situations. I um, would get come to a place where I can't do this anymore. You know, the drugs had gotten so bad, I just, I can't do this anymore. I had tried a couple times to get out of the life. Um, I would work in restaurants um, as a waitress or a server, and I couldn't hold down the job because um, I was involved with drugs. And so I didn't really understand addiction um, back then, but I would stop using and I would say, I, don't, I can't do this anymore, get my life together, go work at a job, be there for a couple months, and then that kind of monkey on your shoulder of addiction um, really starts yelling at you. Um, and all of that trauma, all of that fear, all of that depression, all of that anxiety comes back because that's, for me, what I use drugs for, was to keep all that. And so if all that comes back and I have no new coping skills, I have no new support, and I have no new way of, of being in this world, what am I gonna do? Probably gonna go right back um, to where I was, and that's what would happen. Um, I would get high or um, get drunk and I wouldn't show up for work and I would lose my job, so I'd be back in that place. Um, there was a time that I was working in this club, and I was had gone through my phase of popping narcotics, or pills, narcotics, and I was so desperate to try to get out of that situation. And I was working as a hostess in the strip club instead of working as a stripper in the strip club, because that was again a step out that I could manage or I thought I could manage. And come and there's <laughs> there's this little girl. I shouldn't say little girl, but this young girl comes um, bouncing into the club. We could tell she was not from Portland. <laughs> you, you could tell <laughs> Portland has a very specific characteristic, which I love dearly. Um, this girl looked like she was straight out of LA. Mm -hmm. um, she came in in the fancy clothes, the, the jewelry. Um, we could also tell that she was a stripper, because if there's one thing as a stripper you can do is you can spot another girl that's in the game. And she comes bouncing in, and of course I go talk to her. Where are you from? What are you up to? You're not from here. Why? What are you doing in our club? Um, and she gives me this spiel about, um, oh, she works in L or she works in San Francisco and <coughs> super great, and she's her boyfriend and blah 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 blah. And so we get to talking, and um, within about 48 hours, 48, 72 hours, um, I had been offered a position with a guy who um, is was in the record industry. Um, he had, owned a studio in Oakland, California, and I could go down there and help them with some of the production needs. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those girls when I was younger that I wanted to be a Janet Jackson backup dancer. <laughs> That's what I wanted to be. Um, I had been in dance since I was three, um, couldn't sing, um, but I could dance, and so I wanted to, to do that. 
And you know, when I got older, I never thought that would particularly happen, and it didn't. But um, it was a cool idea, you know. I was 20 years old, um, 19. I was 19 years old. Um, I had been living from place to place. Never really had a house for a couple years. Um, this person comes in, clearly all glammed up. Um, and offers me a way out of the situation. So you combine my ideas about what it means to be successful. You combine my shame and guilt about disappointing my parents and all I ever wanted to do was to provide for them and take care of them like they took care of me because that was my responsibility at 18 years old, um, which is not true. Um, but that's, you know, that's what it was for me at the time. And I just had a lot of guilt. So you combine all that and then you combine that I was in a situation with someone that I was living with who a group of us decided that we wanted to make a um, particular drug and it was fun and thinking it when you're 20 you're like oh yay money um, but then when you actually start thinking about what you were doing it's kind of like oh whoops never mind I don't want to do that I figured out that the consequence of getting caught manufacturing is actually life in prison and when I was 19 years old, that's not something that I wanted to be a part of. And so all of this was culminating at the exact same time. And then here comes this girl who offers me a way out of the situation. One of the other stipulations was, which is a little backwards, but it has the same controlling issue, or the controlling um, point, I guess, is that they told me that I couldn't do drugs. So you take an alcoholic and a drug addict who's desperately trying to get out of that life and you say, but you can't use. So we can offer this to you, but you can't use. Um, I jumped on it. Within 48, 72 hours, I was in Oakland, California. Um, it happened super quick because it doesn't, they purposely don't give you time to think about what you're doing. It's come in, say everything, the right thing to say, whatever you need to hear, and then you meet the guy at the last minute and then you go, oh, wait a minute. But then it's like, oh, well, she's really cool. Um, the other part of that for me was that um, he didn't just take me. He took another girl that was in the club. So not only um, were they offering this to me, they created another area of security for me. I had another girl going with me who I knew. The other part was that um, he really was a legitimate producer. And I wouldn't have trusted them um, per se. I don't think I really did all that much, but I wouldn't have trusted them the way that I did um, if he wasn't a legitimate producer. Um, I was like, oh, he's full of crap. You get these guys coming in all the time. Um, but the guys in the club, it was geared towards the 18 to 25 range. Um, they recognized him. You know who that is? That's so-and-so. Like, he's produced this, he's produced that. Mm. So I was like, oh, well, maybe he is legitimate. So we go to Oakland, California, and that began my world um, into prostitution. Um, I didn't go down there having any intention to getting farther and farther into that world, obviously. Um, but once I got down there, it was a lot of fine dining. It was a lot of going out, getting your hair done, getting new clothes. Um, going around to fancy places, meeting fancy people, driving in fancy cars, and um, staying in hotels. So I, I lived, see I am shaky, I haven't done this in a while. So we go down to Oakland and uh, for the first probably month we lived in a hotel. And part of that was he wasn't gonna take us, us new girls, anywhere that's gonna be able to connect back to him. And so we stayed at a hotel, um, we got to know the city a little bit. Um, once I got down there, that's when I realized that, okay, well, I'm probably going to have to strip again. Okay, you know. Um, so I worked in the clubs with Alicia, the girl that um, brought me in. And we started working in the clubs and at first it was fun. And you got to keep in mind the mind frame of a 19 year old who's on drugs. Back then, um, I was the party girl. You know, I had a couple different personalities. I had the personality when I was at home with my parents. I had the personality with the people that I went to high school with that knew me for a long period of time. And then I had this other person that you put me on drugs 
and you get me in a party scene and I was the one at the parties, the after hours parties, life is great, let's just party. Mm -hmm. um, because that's the only way I knew how to get out of myself long enough mm -hmm. to be comfortable in my own skin. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get down there and it was one big party uh, for a while. The pimp who, um, I'll say his name, well his street name was Showtime. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Showtime, he, um, he kind of stayed at a distance from us a lot. He was around, um, but that girl, Alicia, who picked me up, she was his bottom girl. She was his main girl who has been with him for years. Um, he picked her up out of Hawaii, and to her, he was her savior. Um, to her, she lived in poverty on the streets of Hawaii, um, didn't really see any way out for herself um, at all, um, getting off the streets, and then here comes this man from the States offering her a way of a different life. And so she she was willing to do anything for him. Um, she was willing to, she, she even said at one point she was willing to um, marry a trick. Like the ultimate goal for her is to get money for him. Mm -hmm. And so if that meant that you had to play a trick to the point where you're willing to marry him and take his money and bolt and give it back to your pimp, like that's the extreme that some of these girls will go. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't play. The boyfriend role with me. I don't know if he knew that it wouldn't work or what. Um, I think he knew that it wouldn't work. Um, he played more of a father role for me. He was the caretaker. He was the person who said, oh, everything's going to be okay. It would give me a hug when I was crying. Um, you know, all of that stuff. And the girl, Alicia, she was the enforcer. Um, she was the person who you knew when you're out of line, let's just say, with her. Um, It didn't mean that I did not know that my pimp was capable of violence. He more focused on protecting us as a group, um, the wifeys, as we called each other. The family is another one. Um, he was more in charge of protecting us as a whole. She was more in charge of keeping us in line. And, you know, I don't know when I realized the reality of the situation that I was in. I really don't know because I think I had a lot of moments where I realized what was happening, but I was also really good at just getting it out of my brain. Mm -hmm. um, I was really good at saying, well, there's nothing I can really do, so let's just not think about it. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was a lot of how I worked at the time. And once, once you realize you're in the situation to the point where you're actually scared or you're actually like, I gotta get out of this, You've already been put in a place where there's not many opportunities to run. So, for instance, we were always with this bottom girl 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were with this girl. Um, I was left alone probably twice the whole time that I was there. And the second time was my attempt to run. So, the, the first few times, or the first time, um, I don't know what it was. I just didn't see it out. Um, the bottom girl was what taught me, who taught me how to make the money. So Showtime would set the quota. We had a thousand dollar quota at night. And he would set the quota and then she would teach us how you actually make that amount of money in the night. Um, the goal of the game, the reason why it's a game, is because the tricks try to get as much out of you for the least cost. The girls try to get the most money without doing, without, with the least amount of work. Um, and so it becomes this game, it becomes this manipulation game and sales, and it's a little obnoxious, <laughs> actually. Um, and the pimps do the same thing, it's a sales pitch. Now, just to correlate a little bit, I went um, at Wash U when I was in grad school there, I took a class on um, fund development and marketing and, and things for nonprofits. And my professor, some of you might know, um, Orvin Kimbrough, he's awesome. He's the vice president of the United Way Foundation here in St. Louis. Um, amazing salesman. I've never, that man can raise some cash. I mean, you gotta be to be the fundraising person for United Way. Um, I had a hard time in his class because everything that he was teaching us on how to sell, on how to, I don't wanna say manipulate, but how to um, create the story to get donors the exact same thing that we learned um, that we learned and how to sell ourselves on how to 
get the most money on how to, again, not manipulate, but cater your story. You know, you, you pick the person, you find out what it is their interests are, and you learn how to change your message or at least alter your message to pull at their heartstrings, to pull at what it is that they need from you. Same thing. Um, and that I remember that class was a little rough. <laughs> um, but I learned that not all tools are used for evil, so that's good. Um, so the other thing that I didn't realize until I was doing this work and I was speaking on this, I think it was last year, the year before that I realized it, was when I was in that life, um, you know, he never hit, he never hit me. Um, how he controlled us was threats of violence. Uh, we would witness things happening to other girls. Um, you know, he would take us out on runs, which if there was a girl who left him, he would chase her down, harass her. Um, if there was a girl who was not in the life anymore but left him, same thing, he would harass her, call her, do those sort of things. Um, so it was very clear that he would resort to violence if need be. But the, the pimps that I were with operated on this idea that um, you're there to make them money. We're a commodity and we're property. And so in order to make the most amount of money, he has to take care of his commodity. So that's why we weren't necessarily allowed to be on drugs. Um, because it kills our body, um, it makes us not alert, and it makes us more likely to get busted. Um, we, I remember at one point too, he even had me call my doctor. I was on antidepressants, of course, um, and doing drugs, so that was effective. Um, sorry, my humor is a little <laughs> off sometimes. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. <laughs> you know, and he took me to, um, he let me call my doctor, and he took me to a pharmacy so I can get my antidepressants, right? So I can function for him. Um, he didn't beat us, necessarily. He didn't beat us. Um, I did watch him be violent. Um, but if we had bruises and if we looked like we'd been beat, how are we going to make money for him? Mm -hmm. So these guys that I operated with, it was about the money. You know, there's, there's different levels of pimping. There's gorilla pimps. There's more of the finesse pimps. There's all sorts of levels. There's a whole hierarchy. There's the, the local street guys who they don't leave their five block radius. Um, but then there's the guys who travel regionally, and then there's the guys who travel, you know, across the country, and then the guys who go internationally. So there's all sorts of, of levels. Um, the, the guys that I worked with operated under this, one of the kind of codes was that if you had to force your girl, you're not a real pimp. Mm -hmm. So what does that say? You know, what type of force are they using? Um, it was looked upon as shameful. It was looked upon as, um, it hurt your status if word got out that your girls were afraid of you. Mm -hmm. Or that if um, you had to be violent towards your girls because you're not a real pimp if you have to force your girls. And the other part, um, there was a, Pulling out my phone real quick, it's my mother of all people. I love my mother dearly. We do have a good relationship now. Um, she sent this email to me this week, and actually Facebook posting. <laughs> um, and it was linked to an article that says, Portland pimp sentenced to life in prison. Now this isn't my pimp, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> but um, his name was Hightower. And one of the quotes, I knew Hightower, he ran with the same group, and so I was super excited because he got sentenced to life in prison. Um, but his quote to the judge right before sentencing was, like I said, I'm not a cruel person. All I did was help them, said Hightower. I took them to church. What, what pimp takes hose to church? They don't do that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, honestly, like, okay, you took them to church, but you still turned them out on the streets, you know? That's their mentality. I help them. I help them. And so those were the types of guys that I was with. Um, several things happened. I'm not going to really get into but a lot of things happened. Um, the two main places that I worked was out of strip clubs and out of hotels. Um, I was not a street girl. I didn't walk on the streets. Um, he tried putting me out on the streets once, and I freaked out. Like, just super freaked out. And so he realized, instead of getting mad, I'm just not a street girl. 
And so he put me in clubs and hotels. Um, and so I spent a lot of times in hotels, anything from side of the road, creepy hotels to um, five star hotels, downtown San Francisco, Vegas, Portland, all over the place. Um, our route was San Francisco, Portland, and then Vegas. And he also had girls in LA. He had a separate group of girls out of LA. Mm. And those girls kind of went up and down Portland and um, Seattle. So I worked mainly out of hotels. Um, there were there was a, a particular incident um, in a hotel. It was one it was one I attempted get, to get out. I attempted to leave twice, and this was one of the times. Um, I ended up at a hotel because. I had my parents call the pager. Um, the only way that they could get a hold of me was a pager. He's not a stupid man. He still had to be able to get a hold of me. Um, I no longer had a cell phone because early on they staged a um, theft from my locker at the strip club that I worked. And so everything, my old personal contacts from Portland, my cell phone, all of it was gone. Mm -hmm. um, and I had I could get a hold of my parents, and this was the first, the second time that they left me alone in the strip club. And they left me alone because I was in trouble. I had spoke to another pimp, whole scenario thing, whole thing, bunch of things happened. Um, I was almost kidnapped, and because I wasn't kidnapped, he had to show that pimp respect by putting me out on the street for, to give him an opportunity to get me to go with him. It's a whole weird, we'll get into that one day. We'll talk about the dynamics. <laughs> of the pimp world, the ethics of the pimp world. Um, so one of my punishments was that I was to work double shifts in the club for 30 days. And so they couldn't necessarily supervise me double shifts for 30 days. They did have people watching me, but there was going to be a point where I was left alone. And I was left alone in the dressing room at one point, so I called my parents collect, and I said, get me out of here. I didn't tell them what was going on, nothing like that. I just said, call the pager, say dad's really sick, get me out of here. And so again, my pimp isn't stupid. He knew that at the time, and currently, my mom worked for the Department of Justice. Um, and so I think he knew that if too much got raised, um, that my mom would potentially do something. The, the key was that I didn't know that. I didn't, because of my relationship with my mother, had enough faith that something would be done. Um, and so he used that control too. Um, to keep me there. So I called my parents. She called the pager. And so um, Showtime put me, tried to put me on a plane. Um, he had another pimp drive me to the airport. Um, this pimp decided not to take me to the airport. He tried to get me to work for him because if I broke bread, if I worked for him, then I was under his control. And so he took me to a hotel in San Francisco, and I kept telling him, I was like, I just want to go home. Like, I'm not going to work for you. I'm not choosing up. Like, I just want to go home. And he just thought he would see, right? So he put me in a hotel, um, told me just wait there, and um, he would feel, feel the customers. What I didn't know was that he didn't pay for that room. And um, so I'm up at the hotel. The hotel staff security is calling me. You need to come down and pay your bill. Well, my boyfriend, um, you know, he'll be, he said he'll be back. He's supposed to be back. So at 6 o'clock a.m., um, security comes and pounds on the door to wake me up and throws me out of the hotel. Um, they stood there and watched me while I tried to grab my stuff, and they just put me down in the lobby of the hotel. So at that point, did anyone say anything to me? Did I say, you know, say anything to them if they would have had awareness of human trafficking, of, of what that looked like? Then maybe that would have been different. Um, what I did do, because I found some courage, um, fear is a very powerful thing. Um, I think we underestimate the power that fear has. Um, as a survivor and as getting out, I've dealt with a lot of guilt. A lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of it was my fault. What could I have done differently? I could have done this differently, because, you know, 2020 mm -hmm. is when we look back. So, um, you know, I asked this particular moment I found some courage um, and that's what they try to break out of you they try to they try to keep you in fear and they try to break your spirit and they try to put you into a hopeless state where you just don't think that you can or deserve to get out and that's when they know that you're broke and it's a term they call it broke 
and that's when you, they know that they can leave you alone. At this point, for some reason, I found a little bit of courage, and I called my old pimp and left him a voicemail and said, I'm stuck at this hotel. I'm just trying to get home. If you don't get your butt over here and put me on the plane, then I'm calling the police. And I don't know where that came from. Um, he put me on a plane. Um, and so I got home, and I had called my parents, too, and he knew that I had called my parents from the hotel. So to him, one girl getting back to their parents, you know, he's not going to screw up his multi-million dollar system going on for one girl. So, and I didn't, again, I didn't know that at the time. Uh, so he put me on a plane. Now, I would like to say that that was the end of my journey, but it wasn't. Uh, my father passed away a couple months later. Um, I found myself sitting with my parent, or my mother, um, living at home again. Still unresolved issues, now significant more unresolved trauma. Um, I enrolled in college, because that's what people do when they're trying to turn their lives around. And um, I started going to school, but then the addiction kicks in, the grief of my father, the trauma, not having any coping skills, not having a healthy mother. What do I do? Um, well, I can just have one drink. I'm not really an alcoholic. I'm a drug dealer, or drug dealer. I'm a drug addict. Um, you know, I'm not really an alcoholic, so alcohol's not gonna be an issue for me. Um, the other part that kicks in is, I need money. So, what do I know how to do? Um, you know, I didn't think I had any experience. I could try the hotel and restaurant thing because I worked in catering and hotels of all places too. Um, you know, I could try the restaurant thing again. It's not enough money. How much money am I used to making now? Thousand dollars a night. So going to a hotel or going to a restaurant, making eight bucks an hour, trying to live on my own, that doesn't seem rational. Or that doesn't seem rational. It doesn't seem rational in my brain at that time. Um, the other piece was, well, I don't have to go back to prostitution. I could just go back to stripping. Now I know where it can lead, so I'm better equipped to not go there, mm -hmm. is the other rationale. Again, our denial of rationalization is super strong in us humans. <laughs> but I think we underestimate that as well. Um, so I went back to my old strip club. It didn't take long for Mr. Showtime to know that I was back in the game. Um, and I talked to him and he said, hey, I just want to chat. That's it. I just want to chat. I know you were totally disappointed with what happened in California. <laughs> and I just want to chat. Oh, by the way, I still have the truckload of stuff that's yours. Um, so when I had to move out really quickly, who do you think my stuff went to? Yeah. In the back of his truck. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have that. Do you want it? Bring your dad's truck because he knew my dad died and that he has a truck. Um, and come pick it up. So we go and have lunch. And I got to air my grievances. So again, I had this piece of control, right? So I was led to believe that I have this, I have a little bit of control at this point and I can air my grievances and I can tell him my disappointments. And I remember saying to him, this is how twisted my thinking was, I remember saying to him, you know, you took care of me. But Alicia, Alicia is the one that I can't stand. She was threatening to hit me, she was doing this, she was doing that, and if it, she wasn't in the picture, I probably wouldn't have left. Um, he said, okay, well, here's the deal. You can stay in Portland. Um, you can keep going to school. That was weird. Um, because I need to run some business here in Portland. We're trying to get an escort agency up and going. I don't see you as someone who's just a worker bee, someone who's just gonna bring me money. I see you as somebody who's gonna organize and plan. So I was in charge of now recruiting girls in Portland, um, working the escort line, trying to get that going. Now I had a sense of power. He was off at a distance. I could now do what I wanted, so I thought. Um, it became very clear that even though I was in Portland, um, I was still being watched. Um, I would get phone calls from him that says, so-and-so called me, what are you doing? You're out of pocket. Out of pocket is another term when you're out of line. Mm. Um, so he could actually verbatim tell me what I've been doing, basically, for the last three or four hours um, from the time that I talked to him. 
And so it became very clear um, that I wasn't out of his, his control. Um, there was a lot of rules. Um, obviously, don't do drugs. Um, I was not allowed to really talk to or hang out with people from high school or people that I knew. Um, it didn't take very long before I was doing that, and it didn't take very long before I was doing drugs because I'm, I'm a drug addict. Um, it ended when I got taken back to California for my birthday. We were supposed to go on this fabulous birthday vacation. And I don't know what inside me. He took me to his house, his main house, the one I had never seen before, because apparently he thought I was broke, broken. Um, and it's this huge, like, $4 million house in a gated golf course, like, up in the hills of San Jose. Mm. And so I go there, and I didn't trust him. Like, I think I was losing my um, denial. Um, I was losing my inability to continue to push back reality. And I didn't trust him. Like, there was always still that part of me going, you're doing something wrong. Like, you, this is not, you gotta get out, you gotta get out. Um, and so I went up there, and for some reason, he left me alone in that house, and I searched through everything of his, everything. I was trying to find something that I could use. Um, and I, I got some information from him, um, whatever, but, I didn't get to find a whole lot, but what I did find was this little card and all that game he talks. All of that, like, yo, girl, you know, I, don't, I can't even do it. Mm -hmm. um, like, all that game that he talks to get girls was written on these. I'm sorry. It's not humorous, but these days it kind of is. I have to laugh. Um, it, they're written on these three by five cards of the stuff that he says to girls. So he premeditates. You know, he gets, he figures out which girls he wants, figures out their routine, figures out their weakness, and then he premeditates what he's going to say to these girls. Um, I went back to Portland, and at that point I started planning how I'm going to get out. I didn't know, I didn't think I could, I was terrified um, constantly, but I needed to figure out a way to get out. Um, the breaking point for me ended when um, he called me and basically said, I know you've been out of pocket, you've been doing X, Y, and Z, I'm taking you back to Port or back to California. I knew that when I got back to California, I was either going to be sold or I was going to be in a dumpster. Like it was very apparent that that was what was going to happen. And so I reached out to somebody who was actually, um, she was a nurse practitioner that I've had since I was a teenager. Um, she knew about my addiction, um, but she didn't know about all of this stuff. And so I reached out to her and I just said, I can't do this anymore. I actually called her from the club at like midnight um, and just said I don't I can't do it. Like I need to I need to get out. And I talked to her about the addiction part right and just can't do this anymore. So she was able to get me into treatment. Um, I entered treatment on April 25th, 2002 and it was a Thursday. Uh, <laughs> I remember those days. Um, it was quite sunny that day, and I had been partying all night before because, like, the good drug addict party the night before. Um, and so it was quite bright in the morning, but I made it to treatment. And when I got there, I, the only thing that they had to be concerned about was my addiction. That's it. They didn't need to know about my past. Why do they need to know what just happened? Um, the only thing that I would disclose was that I was a stripper. Um, so in treatment, I was in inpatient for three months. Um, that particular time was, it was a trip. Uh, it was a trip. I don't remember a, a chunk of the first couple of months. I do remember, um, again, I was, I was 21 at the time. Um, I had a rough edge. Um, these girls, I didn't come out like this, and these girls do not come out like poor little pillows sitting on the couch that just want someone to hug them. That is not how we come out. Um, I came out very hard, um, very angry, and very scared. And I was defiant, and I would tell you where to put it, and I would tell you what you don't know about me, and how in the world can you help me? Um, and I had a bit of a mouth <laughs> temper at the time. Um, you know, the, the people in treatment are, are definitely, they were definitely, um, definitely blessed and definitely, I'm, I'm grateful to God to put them in my life. Like, I, to put up with me at 21 when I was getting out of that life, they have to be angels. Um, 
but they had to break through that core. And, and for me, um, it took not being on drugs and it took them poking at me all the time um, for that to crack. And there was one particular thing that cracked for me. It's a random thing, but I, we were watching 28 Days. Have you guys ever seen that? It's, um, what's her name? Sandra Bullock, and it's about a um, character who went to treatment. <coughs> so of course, we're watching this. At two weeks sober, it was not funny. Um, it was not funny at all. We're at a couple of months sober. Um, and there was a particular scene where the people in the treatment center were picking on this guy because he came off the streets, he was a drug dealer, and the other people in treatment, because, you know, we... Never mind. <laughs> the other people in treatment we're saying, what if he doesn't belong here? What is he doing here? He used to live on the streets. He was this, he was that. And I don't know what happened during that moment, but I that shame and that guilt, and that if you really knew what I had done and where I was, you would not want me anywhere near you, kind of all culminated at that point. And in our group that evening, I lost it. It was totally melodramatic, but I lost it. And it was, I just spewed out that particular scene. Like, if you guys, I used to be a hooker, and like, I let it all out. And the people in the treatment center with me were a bit shocked um, at, at what I had just said. And but that was the first time that all of that emotion could come out, and it did. And once that floodgate opened, it was a little late. I think I cried for about six years. Um, <laughs> So I, I went out of treatment. I spent three months there. I went to a sober house in Minnesota. They shipped me off to Minnesota um, from Portland. And um, I went to a sober house there. And so that's where I learned how, started learning how to rebuild my life. I had to get a job. I had to um, go to groups all the time. I was in trauma therapy. I was doing all the things that you're supposed to do to learn your coping skills. Um, and then I ended up in transitional housing. And this particular thing I just realized about three days ago. Um, when I was leaving transition, or when I was leaving the sober house, my caseworker there didn't know what to do with me. It was a facility that was usually wealthy people went there, and so she just did not know what to do with me. And so she was going to put me when I left the sober house, um, put me in a homeless shelter. So again, this is in 2002. Um, yeah, 2002. Clearly. People weren't thinking of you take a girl who just came out of sex trafficking, put them in a homeless shelter. Um, at the time, it wasn't sex trafficking. Um, 1999 was the first TVPA. No, 2001 was the first TVPA. <laughs> um, and so trafficking wasn't even on the radar. I was nothing more than a prostitute. That's it. I deserve what I got. I um, had a sex addiction. Someone even threw that one at me. Um, and I, at one point, remember, I had to be put on restriction at the sober house because I was flirting too much with the boys and we didn't want the prostitute to flirt too much with the boys. Mm. Um, so that was the mentality that was going on. And so she wanted to put me in a, um, in a homeless shelter. Thankfully, I had an advocate at an agency who worked with women getting off the streets who knew better. And so she was trying to find me a couple places to live. And so there was two options. There was one, this transitional housing, it was, you know, I could go live there with another girl trying to get off the streets and it would be, you know, whatever. And then there was this other one that was a convent. And... <laughs> oh, can you picture that? Um, so I... <laughs> So I drive up to this convent in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they, I walk in, and it is the most eerily quiet like, place I had ever been in. Like, it was sweet, you know, and there's these little old ladies who I found out later were sisters, and, um, and I, it was just too much. Like, I love you guys today. I can handle <laughs> But, you know, you take a 20, 21 year old who is about eight, not even eight months, like six months out of the life, out of drug addiction, who is defiant and crazy and a wild child, and then you want to stick her in a convent. And, you know, I had a moment like it was great. I grew up Catholic, like, okay, well, maybe. So I go and I visited. Um, I ended up doing the transitional housing because I had just seen that. <laughs> But I realized, actually, just this week, it was the Sisters of St. Joseph in Crondelet and St. Paul. 
I had no idea that you guys, I had interactions with you guys. Um, so I just realized that this week, so that was super funny. Um, I didn't realize sisters are everywhere. In the <laughs> uh, yes. um, so I am back with the Sisters of St. Joseph, so that's kind of fun. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the importance of recovery. Um, you're fine. Okay. Um, I'm trying to slowly move away from telling details, like too many details of my story, um, for many reasons. But you know, I've been out for 10 years, um, so I didn't get sober and go to rehab and figure out um, that what had happened to me um, was a traumatic event and start dealing with that. Um, I didn't just that didn't just happen in about a year and then all of a sudden I'm better. Um, it doesn't work like that. Um, recovery has been, it, last year was 10 years um, for getting out and um, it's been, huh? Oh, I was calculating, uh, it was Yeah, year. 10 years. <laughs> um, you know, it's been a long road and we don't have, we didn't, back then we didn't have the talking about trafficking, the looking at it as, um, you know, I hate the term forced prostitution, but you know, this idea that these girls on the streets, these girls in the clubs are victims, that just wasn't part of the work. It just wasn't part of it back then. Um, the agency that I, that I was a part of, they got it. I never heard the word trafficking, but we talked a lot about the, the trauma and the force, and there were several things that we did in, the, in that particular um, group, and one of the things that we wrote a letter to our pimp one of the things we did, and um, those were crazy, but I, I'm not even going to say what I wrote, but those were super crazy, and that was the beginning of me realizing that regardless of my drug addiction, regardless of, you know, me having two choices put in front of me, there was a lot of things stacked against me, um, and that I was forced into this way of life that I didn't really want to be in. Um, and it was the beginning of realizing that because I made the decision to strip at 18 years old did not mean that I made the decision to be forced or to get into prostitution and make that the way of my life. Um, it took about, oh goodness, I think I was about two and a half years out, my first relationship. Try having a relationship. <laughs> that was that poor guy. Um, he, he has a heart of gold. Um, we still talk today, actually. Um, but about two and a half years later, um, and after the trauma therapy and after the rehab, um, was about was the first time that I could really say to anybody other than people that I was in the life or that shared the same experiences, say my name and prostitution in the same sentence. Mm -hmm. Like it. I focused for so long on recovering from my addiction, and I needed to because that's the thing that I could handle. Um, what I couldn't handle was working out the stuff that happened, why I was in that life, or working out the stuff that happened that led up to that part of my life. And so for me, at about two and a half years sober, two and a half years out, um, that was the beginning for me to be able to say those words. Um, I still had that shame and that guilt severe shame and guilt that if you really knew who I was, if you really knew where I came from, what I had been through, what I had done, you wouldn't let me anywhere near you. And that's a really big fear. It's when people say it, um, it's kind of like, oh, I hear that. You know, I think, I don't think we really take, um, again, that type of power seriously, the power of shame um, seriously. And and that's and that's where I was that's where I was at, and that was the beginning of me being able to do that. No, I didn't do it. Um, that process. I'm involved in 12-step recovery. Um, it was the process of the 12-step recovery that helped me come to terms with a lot of a lot of that stuff. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, we're starting these agencies. We're um, there's a lot of awareness now. We have all these agencies to help victims, and we can do that. But that's gonna, we're going to be in their lives for probably the first three months, six months, if we're lucky, um, providing services to them. But what happens after that six months when they move on? 
you know, what type of support network, what type of environment are they going to be in that continue to be able to grow and continue to be able to heal? Um, because this is not linear. You know, you move forward. Um, I do great for a few years, and then for some reason something just kicks my butt, and I'm right back um, to those feelings and not really being able to deal with it. Um, and so what are we going to provide these victims to help them create long-term support and solutions. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about um, the process for me. Again, at two and a half years, that was the beginning. Um, at about five years sober and out, um, the word trafficking started popping up. Um, there was a, a young woman who I sponsored through the program um, who had a similar experience of me and that was kind of my first time being able to assist another survivor uh, get out and to continue doing things. And so again, it was in the context of recovery. Um, but we got, to, we got to share our past and we got to share how to move forward in that. Um, and towards the end of our relationship was when all this trafficking stuff came out, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a Sergeant Vic in St. Paul, Minnesota, who, um, amazing Sergeant, um, he, for years have been saying, these girls are victims. These girls are victims. You know, we need to help them get out. Um, and he was actually the person who busted the girl that I worked with. Mm. And um, he offered her a way out to go through a program in St. Paul to help girls get off the streets. Um, and so for me, that was the beginning of hearing trafficking, of hearing like this idea that it's human trafficking, it's slavery, versus I'm just a hooker that happened to have a pimp. Um, Sergeant Vic was killed, um, he, he was an undercover office, officer and he was killed um, unfortunately several years back and um, it was a huge loss to St. Paul. Um, thankfully now we're starting to kind of rebuild uh, the law enforcement there, the people back home that's working on the issue um, are rebuilding the issue there. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is when I started school. So right, I went through this process, I could call myself a prostitute or I used to be one. Um, or someone who had been prostituted, or we want to talk about it these days. Um, and so then I decided, well, I need to start doing something about it. I always had the goal of wanting to help other victims get out of this life. Um, and so I thought, I should probably go to school to do that. So I started school. That was a trip. Um, it took me, everything's a trip, you know. Um, but it took me a long time, it took me a year. So I went to the school. Um, keep in mind, I barely graduated high school. I had a 1.8 GPA when I graduated high school. I think they let me out. I didn't graduate, they <laughs> let me out. Um, I attempted college for a little bit, but drug addiction, pimping, um, kind of, I dropped a few classes. So I had D's and F's in those classes. And so here I am trying to go to college. Um, and. I went in, I had to apply for special circumstances, and so I went in and I talked to the counselor. And again, this fear thing, right? This pesky fear. Um, I go in, I talk to them, I, they tell me what I need to do. I need to write a page, just a page, of why they should let me into their school, why I didn't do good before, and how I was going to do better. So a year later, <laughs> um, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. Um, I tried to do it for about a year. Um, and I just couldn't write a page because I was so terrified that they weren't going to let me in. That I was going to go back to school, and they were going to say, oh, you're a failure, you don't get to come here. And that I was going to find out that I'm really not that smart, that um, I'm really not worth anything. And, you know, a few other things like the drugs ruined my brain, you know, and like all this stuff. Um, that intense fear kept me from going back to school for a long time. Um, again, thankfully, I had um, a huge support network in the recovery rooms and program um, who said, shut up and do it. You know, I mean, I needed that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love my friends. Um, you know, I, I needed that because, again, I'm really heady. I like to analyze everything. And I second guess and rationalize and all that stuff, that, that crap that's just in your head that stops you from doing what you need to do. And so I need people in my life that says, shut up and do it. So I just need to do stuff instead of thinking about it sometimes. So I went back to school. Um, there was one point during school, about half, about two years in, where 
Um, my life got a little bit out of control again. Some stuff came up around the prostitution and around the trafficking. Um, some trauma stuff that I didn't really know how to deal with or, or, or what. Um, and thankfully I was able to push through that. I had a strong support network. But it's, they come up at the most unopportune times. So it's finals week, of course. Mm -hmm. And there was something in class that just, I don't know what it did, but it just triggered something and a relationship was falling apart. Like, it's life, it's life. Um, but when you don't know how to cope with life, and you didn't learn how to cope with life, or start learning until you're 21, and then you have to go back and recover from a lot of that stuff and learn how to cope with life, life just seems to be a little bit bigger than, we, than you can handle sometimes. And so, um, again, thankfully, I had that support network. Again, I wasn't at an agency, I wasn't at, um, a place where they're helping girls get off the streets. This was just life. Um, and so I had built a support network, thankfully, that um, I could fall back on, who knew me for who I was, who knew me for my past, and knew that that's not who I am, and that where I'm going is who I am. And so I was able to push through, through that. Um, I graduated with a bachelor's in social work. Um, again, I remember trying to apply to the social work program after I'd been to school for a couple years. It was, again, it took me forever. I was like freaking out, they're gonna hate me, I'm gonna suck at it, like all of this crazy fear, I'm not smart enough. Um, you know, this social work program, and it's not like I was going to Yale. Like it was the, it was a state university, Metropolitan State University, which I love. Um, it's a four-year university, but it's geared towards adult learners. So, you know, I wasn't going to Yale, I was going to a community university. Um, but I thought for sure I wasn't smart enough to get into the program. <laughs> Again, this fear, right, and this self-doubt, um, this I'm not worth anything. Those are the legacies, I think, of, of that life for me. Um, one of the things that happened was I applied to grad school. Again, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. My professor said, I don't know if you got a self-doubt thing or what, but just apply. He actually told me to get over it, is what he said to me. <laughs> I was like, okay. And I really wanted to go to Columbia University. I don't particularly know why, um, but I really wanted to go to Columbia, but it wasn't going to happen, right? I didn't think I could do it, all this stuff, and that's when my professor told me to just get over it. I have a self-doubt issue. Um, so I applied to grad school. I got in to a few different places, um, and I chose to come here to Wash, Wash U, the Brown School of Social Work. And... Um, one of the things that happened for me before I left, um, I've never been very financially secure since I got out. Um, going to school, struggling college student. Um, worked, making nine bucks an hour, you know, for the however long. So financial insecurity for me is something that triggers a lot. Um, and I do, I have thought about it over the years. So when I find myself not being able to pay my rent, what's the first thought? Well, I know how I can make some money. Yeah. Um, those old messages and those old tapes do not go away. They just don't. They go farther and farther back. The healthier I am, the harder it is for them to pop up. But in those weak moments, in those times where I'm super stressed out, I have like no self-esteem for some reason, or life is happening, those little things sneak back in and say, and say things to me. We found my pimp, and this was something that happened early last year. And um, I don't particularly think I was that prepared for it. Um, it, it wasn't a goal, um, per se, but we have some friends who are detectives and investigators now. So I was like, hey, just run the name. So he came back to me and said, tell me a little bit about him. And so I did, and it was him. And he's still active. He owns a bunch of escort agencies and production companies around the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, Chicago, Portland, L.A., San Francisco, Vegas, some on the East Coast. Um, and everything was right. He came over from Jamaica. Um, what, I, what we think is that he actually came over illegally. He has some previous charges for impersonating U.S. citizens. Um, now, the thing with this is I'm not, I'm not going after any sort of... First of all, there were no statutes when I was involved with him. Um, there were no trafficking statutes. So even if we were to go after this guy and arrest him, my case, there would, nothing would happen. Because when I was involved, we didn't have laws 
to protect girls um, and to put pimps in jail. So if we were ever to go after this person, it's going to be for current. Um, I'm more interested, we don't even think he's really pimping out per se. That sounds really bad now that I said it out loud. Um, he runs escort agencies and we think he's so far removed from the girls on the streets that it would be really hard to get him. Um, and I prefer these days to focus on the girls that we can help um, right now. One of the things that that did was um, brought a lot of stuff back. So I'm, again, I don't know why I'm telling you this, maybe because you're sisters and you guys seem to pull stuff out of me. Um, but it's been, part of it, it's been kind of a rough year. I didn't think, Kimberly said to me at one point, she knew, she knew when that happened, she saw a difference in me. Um, and so again, 10 years later, here it comes. Um, trauma comes back. Um, so again, thankfully, I have supportive people in my life. Um, I'm not thinking about going back. It's not that type of trauma. Um, but those, those thoughts and those feelings, those, the insecurity, the shame, the guilt, that stuff really doesn't leave. Um, it goes away for a long time. It gets deeper. But then it'll come back. And so I'm telling you guys this because um, a lot of times when we see survivors talk or when we hear stories, um, it's, okay, they got out, yay, all better, um, and that's not the reality. So um, what I would like to do, and I was just talking to them, is um, we want to get Healing Action open. We want to start the process to help girls to get out of this life. Um, but we need to change our communities too, um, to be able to provide support for these girls for when they get out of agencies who can help them with their immediate needs. One of the things that we run into is coming from this, coming from this life is that this, the culture that normalizes stripping, that normalizes prostitution, that normalizes pimping, um, the men who I run into on a daily basis, who drive me bonkers. Um, you know, the, the, it's just trivial to a lot of people and there's jokes and comments and most of the time I can be fine with it and I'm like, you're just ignorant. Um, <laughs> that's kind of how I think sometimes. Um, but then other times like, it can really affect your day-to-day -day, day -day life. And I want to tell you a little bit about something that just recently happened, and then I'll shut up. Because I tend to talk a lot sometimes. Um, I actually get up here thinking I'm not going to be able to talk for more than five minutes. And then it never happens. So I'm not going to mention out loud, like publicly where I work, um, but I work with adults with disabilities. and. So I work with this company, it's really great. Early on, um, I, I was working direct care in the houses because I was still trying to do Healing Action Network um, and I just needed some income because that's not, that doesn't pay anything when you start a nonprofit. <laughs> um, and working part time and whatever, and I had this, this boss um, who, she was telling me about, um, recently we were supposed to have this new staff. Actually, I'd already moved up to a supervisor at this point. So I moved up to a supervisor level, which I managed a couple houses. And we had this staff that we were really, that she was really excited for, bring her in, and we were waiting on backgrounds. So this, so my boss came back to me and said, we're not gonna get the staff. And I was like, well, why are we not gonna get the staff? She had a prostitution charge that came up on her background. So at this point, nobody I worked with knew my history. I mean, you can Google my name and you can figure it out. But, um, I mean, I don't really know who knew. But I know these people did not know. And she was like, oh, it sucks. Like, she was really great. Um, but she has this prostitution charge. And it was from, like, five or six years ago. And they couldn't hire her because, I mean, who wants to hire a prostitute, right? They didn't know that she had one sitting in front of her. Um, not any prostituted person sitting in front of her. Um, later on, very recently, um, I'm now a manager at this particular location, um, or this company, and we, I had a staff get all mad at me, because as a manager, I manage about 70 staff and a couple supervisors, so I manage a lot of people. And if you think about the population I manage, it's an entry-level position, um, it requires a high school degree, that's it, and no experience. 
Um, and so I manage a lot of people and it's been a really great experience. Um, but I also am like apparently the queen of write-ups. <laughs> apparently, I like structure um, and policies. I didn't know that until I got older. Um, but, you know, we're, we're caring for people and so we are pretty strict um, of what is allowed and what isn't. And so I do a lot of write-ups and I've had to fire a lot of people. I've never had to fire this many people. Um, and so I had a particular staff get awfully angry with me, um, a couple staff. Um, one of them got termed and the other one I just told her she couldn't work at my houses anymore. So I get a phone call on my work cell and it's a person who has disguised their voice um, and she decided to inform me that, um, I'm not going to give you all the details, but basically she heard about my secret prostitution past on Channel 2. <laughs> Which I kind of laughed because I was like, really? Secret? Channel 2? YouTube? Like, sorry, can I send you the other news channels that I've been on? <laughs> it's not that secret. Um, but she thought it was going to, you know, affect my work. So she found out about it. She threatened me with it, said I, she wonders how corporate is going to think about, what is going to think about having a hooker um, work for them. Said a few more things, but we don't need to get into that. Um, <laughs> So currently, at 10 years out, I do not have a criminal record, so I can pass background checks, and no one needs to know. I had to have a meeting with my boss and say a staff threatened me and play this voicemail with them. Now, some of the people that I work with have known. Um, it's not something that I talk about at work. It's completely separate. Um, I go there to do my job and, and to help the people that I help there. Um, but again, it's not secret. So when the Channel 2 News thing came out, a couple people were like, hey, I saw you on the news. Awesome. And that was the end of it. Um, but I had to play this for our HR director, um, my director, and our invest internal investigator. And um, thankfully I worked for a company that was kind of, I was like, is this going to be an issue? You know, if it gets sent to corporate? I mean, they were horrified. I forget how horrified people get at my story. Um, I'm so desensitized to it, I forget. <laughs> Um, so when they heard that I was a sex trafficking victim, they, you should have seen the look on their face. It was like, oh God. Um, and and I, I wasn't worried about it per se. I didn't care that they knew. Like I don't have that level of shame these days where if you find out that that's my history, I'm not going to freak out. Um, but I was kind of like, is this going to be bad if they send it to corporate? And she was like, oh no. Nope. Not bad at all. Um, so I'm glad that I work for a company, but something that happened 10 years ago can affect, potentially affect my job today. I don't have a criminal record. Um, I do advocacy work against that, or against sex trafficking. Um, but this public image, this community image of girls, girls, not men, I can't, not men, but girls who have been in this life is so insane that at 10 years, I could have been, 10 years later, I could have been fired from my job because <laughs> I spoke out against human trafficking. So those are the images, those are the kind of the themes that we're trying to fight against. Um, men don't have that. Yeah, there's kind of a shame issue sometimes, but it's like if you call it something else, then no one really knows what it is, right? So, um, you know, if you had a man, if the man in my company found out that he was a John, um, now if it would have been, if they could keep it under wraps, then it would be okay. But if it's going to be linked to buying prostitutes, then it might be an issue. Um, it's starting to be more of an issue for men, which I'm actually really happy about. Um, you know, again, I'm just super happy about because we don't pay attention to the jobs. Um, so 10 years later, I still have ramifications. The last thing I'll say is that um, one of the things I had to do early on to get out from under my pimp was file bankruptcy. There was property put in my name um, that I was forced to sign on that I didn't really know what, a, what necessarily I was signing. So there was a couple luxury cars and a few things. So I had, to, I had filed bankruptcy. So 2012 was when my bankruptcy ended. 2012, my bankruptcy is no longer on my credit. So for 10 years, when I go to purchase a car, when I had to get a credit card, when I had to apply for a job who required credit checks, which they're starting to do these days, um, I had to explain why I had a bankruptcy mm -hmm. on my credit. So 10 years later. 
So these are the, some of the long-term effects that these girls that we're seeing when they come out of it, they have to deal with.